So we're going to, uh, for the next approximately 50 minutes, learn about um, the statistical tests that are at the basis of pathway enrichment analysis and, um, uh, in general, finding overrepresented pathways in gene lists. Um, and Veronique can help me uh, if I miss a point that you, uh, cause you've also given this, this lecture. Um, so uh, the basic objectives of this module are to learn about the statistics behind the enrich, uh, behind uh, st uh, enrichment analysis, pathway enrichment analysis, uh, to be able to select the appropriate enrichment test out of multiple that are available, um, be able to uh, understand uh, what the ID the concept of a background gene list is when running Fisher's exact test, or also known as the hypergeometric dis distribution, um, be able to compute a minimum hypergeometric test on a ranked list. So we'll get into exactly the difference between a ranked list and a regular gene set list. Um, be able to determine when you need to, to do multiple testing correction and what type of multiple testing correction you want to use. And to um, be able to select whether to use a Bonferroni corrected p-value or a false discovery rate. Um, and then also explain in plain language how you calculate each correction. Okay, so this lecture will cover uh, an introduction to enrichment analysis. Uh, we'll focus on the hypergeometric test, as I said, also known as the Fisher's exact test, or vice versa. And um, also this different type of statistics that are used in the GSCA software, um, the gene set enrichment analysis software, which is called the minimum hypergeometric test for a ranked list, although it has different names. And then also to cover multiple testing correction, including Bonferroni correction and the false discovery rate computation using the benjamini hochberg procedure. Okay, so um, so we're, uh, this lecture is going to be fairly focused on statistics. And then after, uh, after lunch, officially we have in the schedule that you can do the um, a lab, and the lab we've scheduled an hour and a half to try out all of these things, and that's where you you can use your own gene list, you can use G, you know other gene lists that are that are available, and then you can actually try all of these things out. If I uh, if we happen to end earlier with the with this lecture, then we'll just make more lab time before lunch, and we can get started on it. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we've talked a lot about gene lists this morning, and um, one of the major types of gene lists, as I mentioned uh, multiple times, is comes from gene expression analysis. And the sort of typical example is that you identify genes that are differentially expressed in your condition compared to control. And in the old days, uh, people basically um, would set an arbitrary threshold to, people might still do this now, but like when, when, when gene expression analysis started out, the only way that people analyzed their their genes or defined a gene list was to set a threshold on the expression level change. So in gene expression analysis, you have you know a set of experiments that you've run on your condition of interest and a set of experiments that you've run on your control. So you have multiple replicates ideally. And then you can use a statistical test to identify uh, whether a gene expression level is differentially is differential, significantly differentially or say, let's say the gene is significantly differentially expressed between the two get conditions, your condition and the controls. So usually the way that that works is you have, uh, because you've done multiple, multiple replicates, you have a set of numbers associated with gene A in condition A and a set of numbers associated with gene A in, in your controls. And you can compare, if you look at the distribution of those numbers, you might see a normally distributed set of numbers and, and another normally distributed set of numbers. And, um, um, uh, it's not easy to use a whiteboard here, but you can, uh, many of you are probably familiar with a t-test and you can, the t-test is a statistic that sort of measures how significantly different two distributions are, are from each other, assuming normal distribute, just normally distributed, uh, data. And, um, so usually you see these two like plots, like normally distributed plots. And if they're on top of each other, they're not differentially expressed. 
Um, and if they're far from each other, the farther they are from each other, the more differentially expressed they are. And it gets a stronger and stronger p-value as a result of a standard test like t-test. Um, there's lots of different tests like t-test for the different types of statistical um, statistical assumptions, like non-normally distributed data. Um, but the idea is that people used something like a t-test, and then they had a, a threshold that they said, um, we will take genes to be differentially expressed if it's um, uh, p-value of the t-test is less than 0 0.05. And in addition, um, they added another criteria of expression change, expression level change. So sometimes you can get, um, if you have a lot of replicates especially, you can get genes that would be, you know, they're, they're actually differentially expressed statistically, but they're not very uh, far from each other in the... Um, uh, in, in numbers, like they might be still quite closely expressed, you know, their, their expression levels might still be quite close. And so people said, oh, well, we also want the expression levels to be, you know, twofold more than, um, you know, in condition versus control. So condition uh, is, it needs to be at least twice as highly expressed or under, you know, overexpressed or underexpressed compared to control. Now the problem, does anybody, can anyone tell me about why that might not be a good idea to, to do, like, kind of cutoffs like that. So the, so the issue is, is that it's, especially this expression change is arbitrary. You can't, you can't write in a paper, we chose twofold expression because, of, and then have an explanation that's like a biological explanation of why twofold expression is better than onefold expression or 1.9 or something. So there's no way to really know what that right expression level changes unless you had like a really, you know, uh, like a bimodal distribution in your data or something and there's no data between, you know, one fold and eight fold or something, you know, then you could say maybe we just could split them because there's actually the data says that there's two different things. But in general, there's no um, kind of, it, it's, it's pretty arbitrary. And so thousands and thousands of papers were published, especially in the beginning of gene expression uh, in the history of use of, use of uh, genomics for measuring gene expression that used this, this threshold. Um, and it was just basically copying what other people did. And the first people who did it, it was just a convenient thing that they did it that way because they didn't have statistics that would help them avoid that. Um, so sometimes it is uh, possible to have a, a generate a data from a genomics experiment that gives you a gene list and you know exactly what gene should be on that list. I gave some examples this morning. For instance, a protein interaction screen. You identify a set of proteins that are bind to your protein of interest. It's just those proteins. There's no extra proteins that could be found. It's just those are the ones that are identified. Or some any kind of similar test of where you're looking at interactions, like uh, a uh, like molecular interactions, often the experiments will tell you exactly what's interacting. I mean, there might be some confidence measures that you can week to get different, slightly different answers, but those won't be on the level of interaction. They'll be on like the, um, the uh, confidence of identifying the protein or something like that. So for gene expression data, though, um, it's not really natural to just arbitrarily define a cutoff in the expression fold change. So, um, you know, so ideally what you'd want to do is not do that. And so what you're left with if you don't do that, is a list of all of the genes and their differential expression level. And that ends up being a really big list. And a lot of the genes are, you know, it, for an RNA-seq experiment, it's the whole genome. And sometimes you can get a whole bunch of other genes that are on there. So you get all the protein coding genes. You might get links, long non-coding RNAs, and, and other types of RNAs. You probably won't get short RNAs because there's different RNA-seq pro uh, procedures for that. Although some of the new RNA-seq technologies are actually, I think, combining everything so you get all of the different RNA molecules. Um, but uh, um, the natural way of representing that data is just this big long list and you rank, you can rank the list by the differential expression. So you can compute the differential expression and you can also compute, if you have replicates, you can compute a p-value. So it's okay to, to filter on the p-value. You can say, I'm, I'm going to take only genes that are differentially expressed that are um, uh, you know, sorry, technically it's okay to filter on a p-value. I'm going to take genes that are differentially expressed less than, you know, 0 0.05 of a t-test, uh, uh, p-value of a t-test. But you actually don't need to do that. And if you don't do that and you work with the whole data, 
you could make use of all of the information. And now there are statistical people Actually, they've been the statistical tests have been around for a long time, but over time, people sort of learned how to use them effectively in genomics. There's statistical tests that allow you to use all the data without setting any thresholds, and that's a lot easier to write about in a paper. We just took the data and we analyzed it. It wasn't it, you don't add an extra step. Of, you took the data, we filtered it in these different ways, and then we analyzed it because people could always come back and say, "Well, if you change this number, are you going to get different results?" So. Um, so that's the idea of a ranked list. So this, this lecture is really talks about two things. Statistical tests that are based on gene lists, which is really everything that I was talking about this morning, and then an additional concept, which is this concept of the ranked list, where you, um, uh, you have all of your data that comes out of the experiment, and usually that's for an expression, uh, RNA-seq experiment, the whole genome. Uh, you know, 20,000 genes in, in the human genome, for instance. Um, okay, so for the gene list, so just keep in mind that there's two types of gene lists that we're talking about, the gene list and the ranked gene list. Okay, gene list is just a set of genes, and the ranked gene list is ranked according to some value, some score, like differential expression. Okay, so, um, so expression, enrichment analysis of a gene list is very much of the type that I introduced this morning. So it answers the question, are there any gene sets surprisingly en enriched or depleted in my gene list? And the typical statistical test that's used is the Fisher's exact test, also known as the hypergeometric test. For anyone who knows about statistics, you could also use the chi-square test. Chi-square test is the test that we actually learn about in high school and undergraduate, like as the test for looking at um, uh, you know, differences in um, distributions of two categorical variables. Um, and the Fisher's exact test is similar. The reason why we use the Fisher's exact test is that the uh, chi-square test is actually doesn't work well with low numbers, but it was uh, with small numbers, but it was the one that everybody used for many years because it was easier to calculate. The Fisher's exact test is like before computers was hard to calculate because it has factorials in the equation. You have to like work with big numbers, but com computers calculate it very quickly now, and so it's actually pretty much should be used all the time in that particular case. So, um, uh, and this hypergeometric idea is, it follows the hypergeometric distribution, which is like a distribution related to categorical, like, you know, uh, discrete values, um, one of the discrete value distributions. Um, so, um, okay, and then the, uh, so keep in mind that with the gene list, you're wondering if there are gene sets surprising, like another set that's enriched or depleted in my set. Just a note about nomenclature. So in this course we've chosen to use, in this workshop we've chosen to use the term gene list to be the list of genes that you're interested in. And um, gene set is the pathways or other things that are set, we have a database of sets. We just separate those because it's, they're actually both sets, but um, but it, if we say gene set, <laughs> your gene, it's hard to to talk about them if we don't kind of separate them. So we, it's it's not official terminology, um, although a lot of people kind of use that. But gene list is just thinking about the list of your list of genes, and gene sets are, um, you know, pathways, a pathway gene set, or any other kind of gene set. Okay, the rank list answers the types of statistical tests on the rank list answer the questions. The question: Are there any gene sets ranked surprisingly high or surprisingly low in my ranked list of genes? And we'll talk about that but uh, in more detail. But um, basically, you're looking for, if you have a, a set of genes that are differentially expressed, um, uh, say you have 20,000 genes in the human genome, and they're ranked by overexpression to underexpression. In the middle of the list, it's equal expression between cases and controls. Uh, so there's no differential expression in the middle. Um, if I have a pathway, that, a pathway gene set that I want to see if it's enriched in my list, if I look at that pathway gene set and I look at the genes in my big ranked list um, that are um, in that set, like I look at all the cell cycle genes in my big long list, ranked list, if they're spread randomly everywhere, I probably, that probably means that the cell cycle is not re relevant for my experiment. However, if the cell cycle genes are all at the top of the list, it's like all the high expressed genes are cell cycle genes and then like nothing else, it's just cell cycle all at the top. It's like, wow, that's very unusual. Like, if by random chance I just expect my gene set to be, my genes of a pathway to be spread out all over the list, now I have this, like, really non-random uh, pattern of, like, everything bunched up at the top of the list. 
And anything that I say about the top of the list, you can also think about the bottom of the list. So um, you know, everything bunched up at the top is as statistically significant as everything bunched up at the bottom. You can also have things that are bunched up at the top partly and bunched up at the bottom. Those are actually just treated separately. So we think of the top of the list as one thing and the bottom of the list as another thing. But um, there could be questions about you know, the interpretation of things when you see that kind of pattern. But let's just keep it simple just to explain the statistical test. The statistical test is looking for uh, a set of genes that's bunched up at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list. OK? Um, and this particular statistical test uh, that you know, this, this um, uh, one that we're going to cover is called the minimum hypergeometric test uh, and uh, GSEA. Actually, they're two different tests. Um, and, the, um, uh, and there's a bunch of others, but we, we won't cover them. Um, so um, let's see. I just need to. Um, OK. There are, uh, so, OK, so let's, let's start with this first gene list. OK, so again, using the gene expression experiment, um, if I, so this is the general idea of the enrichment test, which I talked about this morning. So we have our omics data set. It generates a list of some sort. It could be a gene list that is discrete, or it could be a ranked gene list. So we run our enrichment test. Um, we have our gene set databases, and I like calling these pathway gene sets to start again. Um, and then we get uh, enriched pathways that result, or enriched set of gene sets. Um, so here's the spindle pathway and the apoptosis pathway, and they get some kind of score. This is the enrichment score. It's the value statistic that comes out of statist the, whatever statistic you choose for, for this. And, and when we go through the, this more, and actually in the lab, you'll see that there are actually multiple scores computed. So we'll talk about those. OK, so um, getting to back to the basics of, an, of gene list enrichment analysis, given a gene list, like these genes, which are, happen to be yeast genes, um, we want to look for gene ontology annotations that are, um, you know, take any annotations, and we want to know if they're surprisingly enriched in the gene list. And as we discussed this morning, um, we want to know where the gene lists come from. And as we're talking about now, we want to assess how surprisingly these, uh, this pattern is. Um, and then we also what we'll talk about now is how to correct for repeating the tests. Because if you keep repeating the tests forever, you're always going to get an answer that you want. right? But you have to correct for that somehow. OK, so the standard design for generating the gene list is we call a two-class design. So this is what I've always mentioned, cases and controls, condition versus controls. But you can just generally think about it as class one, class two. It doesn't have to be controls, for instance. Like for a pendomoma, we had type A and type B. And so we compared one type versus the other. Um, and then you, uh, based on your uh, differential statistic, like I mentioned, the t-test, um, for RNA-seq data, um, usually the, um, uh, so you can, you can generate different, different statistics that help you rank your list. So you could just look at the ratio of expression values frequently called the fold change. The, the, the grammar doesn't totally make sense on that, that term, but it's, um, it's basically the ratio of expression levels in two conditions. Um, you can look at the log of that ratio, and that, that um, uh, is frequently done. Uh, the t-test is used if you have continuous data. Um, and, for, um, and, and for microarrays, people also like to use this thing called significance analysis of microarrays. These days, people are using RNA-seq. Um, and RNA-seq is a bit different than microarrays because you're actually counting the expression levels of, you're counting the number of transcripts, basically, that you see in the, in the RNA-seq experiment. So um, when you uh, do your experiment, you, um, you're basically sequencing transcripts, but you don't sequence all the transcripts. You sample the transcripts, and you're using a DNA sequencing technology to read it. DNA sequencing technology these days only reads short reads up to like 100 or 150 base pairs. Ideally, you want to sequence every transcript and you want to do the whole thing, but we don't have technology that does that these days for every transcript. So we're fo forced to work with these short reads. And then you take the short reads and you align it to the genome and you use a genome reference that exists. Like for human, people usually use the gen code alignment um, definition of where genes start and end. Um, and uh, and then 
you know, as these as these uh, these reads build up on your on the tr on the transcript, um, they basically get counted, and so you, you get counts like one transcript count or a hundred or a thousand, and um, a lot of uh, and, and so you, you're left with these counts, and then it's often you, you can have zeros, and so the particular statistics relating for, to that have been um, modeled, and you can't really use a t-test, so people use uh, different types of statistical tests, and a popular <laughs> example is um, in a package called Edge R, which implements um, um, and I'm just forgetting, again forgetting the name of the statistical test that they use there, but they they have a distribution that's. Uh, not normal, and they model they model the data with a non normal distribution. Um, I, I can look it up if anyone's interested. Um, does anyone use other types of um, Has anyone used other types of differential statistics for their RNA seq data? Or any, you had a question? I had a question. Yeah. Okay. So when you're calculating a t test or whatever this other test is, um, are you talking about biological replicates within the experiment? You're talking about replicates, yeah. So, sorry, I should mention that these this expression matrix here is a set of um, ex, a set of expression values. Sorry, a set of measurements for one class and a set of RNA seq data points for another class. If you just have one RNA seq for your uh, for your class one and one RNA seq for your class two, you can't compute statistics. The only thing you can compute because all statistics are based on some uh, estimate of variance, basically, which helps you understand the expected. The, expect, the expectation. So um, if you can't estimate variance because you only have one or two, you know, that two is hard to estimate variance from, um, then you can only do something like a, a ratio of numbers. And you'll have to be aware that sometimes that ratio will uh, give you very high numbers even though you, uh, you it's not really significant. It's not something you want to look at. So like, for instance, a, bi a big number versus a small number. Um, you'll have problems with that. So uh, statistics help you deal with that. So it's it's best to it's best to deal have replicates, but especially in the beginning of any technology, replicates are usually expensive. So people didn't include replicates. So in the beginning of microarrays, nobody had replicates. Then everybody had replicates, and now RNA seq. The beginning there, they didn't have replicates. And now everybody have replicates. Single cell RNA seq is all no replicates right now, but next year might be replicates. So it's just a matter of cost. Um, so it is possible to. Uh, compute your differential statistic without replicates using like a ratio or some other thing like difference, whatever you actually want to make up is, as long as it's kind of assessing all the genes at the same time or uniformly, then you can rank them by that and you can do the analysis. And one of the nice things about pathway analysis is that it doesn't rely on problems with individual genes. Like it's not necessarily sensitive to uh, statistical problems you have with measurements of individual genes because you're looking for a pattern of many genes. And so if all the genes are going up in the same direction or down in the same direction, that, that's a pattern that's more difficult to achieve randomly. Um, so there are some benefits of pathway analysis for dealing with noise in the data, but you, you, you do have to be aware that if you don't have replicates, you're going to have a problem with noisier data, basically. Does that, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Another question? So, like the Wilcoxon man Whitney rank sum test, is that what you're talking about? I think that's probably the one. So that that's that's a rank test that's similar to these rank tests that I mentioned. So for rank lists. Um, so yes, uh, for a rank, I, in general, we recommend a, using a ranked st statistic if you have a ranked if you have a ranked gene list. So we, basically, the main recommendation is. Avoid arbitrary cutoffs if you can, and use of a test like the rank, uh, a rank-based test, which I'll explain in more detail how they work, um, will avoid you having to make a threshold. And in particular, the threshold is is here. So, so yeah, each of these like columns here, which you can't really see, is a different a different experiment. So you have replicates here, a bunch of replicates for blue and a bunch of replicates for red, and you can compute the differential expression between blue and red. And genes at the top of this list are more expressed in red than blue, and genes at the bottom of the list are more expressed in blue than red. And so this is the ranked list that we'd like to use. Now you could compute a, this the threshold is basically like setting a line here and saying everything above the threshold, this threshold is up in red, and everything below is down in blue. And I'm not I'm gonna ignore everything in the middle. So we we recommend if you can avoid it to not make this threshold here. If you do make this threshold, 
you can use the gene list statistics. If you don't make this threshold, you use the rank statistics. And we prefer the rank statistics. And what you mentioned, I think, is a rank type of rank statistic. OK? Does that make sense? Yeah. Going back to the question of replicates, so if you, um, if you were looking at like a very small population of cells, and then um, you can't actually have replicates, but you have, like you, you might have replicate um, in terms of biological experiment, but then you have to pull whatever you have to get the data that you need. So would that take care of the replicate problem? Because you just pull like a bunch of... Uh, so, so the question is, does pooling help with replicates? It doesn't, it doesn't help ultimately, but it does um, help kind of create an average of your data. So if you pool different samples, and that was an approach that people, there's definitely many people have used that approach. Um, it, and so it, it definitely helps uh, kind of keep, make, sort of smooth things over, right? And smoothing things over will avoid problems where we have like random fluctuations that cause big changes in uh, like ratios. Um, there are, is a couple of additional, there are a couple of additional things to be said about replicates that you reminded me of. One is um, it, the replicates are more important the more variance you have in your data. Like the noisier your data are, the more, the more you need replicates. So if you have data that's very clean, you need less replicates. And you usually don't know that. To actually figure out how many replicates you have, you have to do a power analysis, which people have talked about, but usually power analyses come with a lot of assumptions. Um, and the best way of doing it is actually to do an experiment and kind of figure out what the variance is, and then you can you can do a power analysis. We don't usually do power analyses, most people don't, for gene expression data, because we usually don't know. It's possible to do that, and there are people who do this, um, but it ends up being an estimate. Um, but in general, there's sort of a few general guidelines. So certain types of data are known to be less variable than others. So cell lines are less variable than p p patient populations, right? Especially if you're taking something from uh, different times, different ages, different ethnic groups, and like p people eating different things, um, you'll get more variability compared to lab-controlled experiments. So that things like that you can kind of get a sense for, or if you have clonal populations of, of anything you're in your, your, your organism that you're studying, you expect that to be more less variable than wild, like uh, wild type field based populations. So that can help a little bit. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, time course design, um, uh, I, spent, I need to make sure that I cover all, all the statistics. So, so um, just quickly, um, here's another example of an experimental design for, uh, for GeneList. So here we have a time course, so we have different expression profiles measured at different times, and we cluster them, and you might find that certain genes follow certain patterns, and each cluster defines a list. So this is another way of creating a list, but we didn't create a threshold. We found genes that are similar to each other, and that creates a list, and so now we have a list. Okay, so getting to the actual statistics, so we have a, a gene list enrichment test um, where we, we've somehow defined a list, and this is not going to be a ranked list. So we have our list of genes that are upregulated, just for purposes of, of discussion. Background is all of the, and this is the kind of old way of doing it that I mentioned. So, but it, we're still using this example of gene expression. You can still think about it being valuable when you do things like this, when you cluster or other ways of defining a list where you really want a list. So here, um, just to explain a few concepts, Here's the threshold that we applied in this case to generate, to, to define our gene list. And everything, the whole thing, this whole rectangle is the background. It's all the genes that, on this example, on a microarray, um, but it's basically the list of any gene that you can hope to recover in your experiment. So some experiments don't find certain types of genes. Those are not part of the background. So the background is the universe, sometimes called the universe, of all the genes that you could detect. Um, that your experiment could possibly identify. So just keep that in mind. That's an important concept. Uh, and then we have our gene set database, or our pathway gene set database. So as I mentioned before, um, the statistical test looks for overlap of the gene set to the uh, gene list. But it's more than that. It actually, it's not just um, that. It, it also considers the overlap of the background. So um, uh, here is... Um, so basically, we have uh, a few numbers, the size of the gene set, the size of our gene list, and 
the expected and, and also the overlap of, um, of the gene set to our gene list and the overlap of the gene set to the, to the universe of all possible genes we could think about. So on an RNA-seq experiment, it's the universe is like all the genes in the genome. So, um, you know, this is similar to the ex example I mentioned before where we have, um, where we have uh, you know, the cell cycle. Half of our genes are cell cycle, but only 5% of the genome is cell cycle. So we have much more enrichment of cell cycle genes. So the actual way that the, um, the uh, test is carried out is this hypergeometric test considers those four numbers, the, the overlap, the, the size of each gene set, your list and the set, uh, and the overlap of the, um, your gene set with a pathway, uh, sorry, your gene list with a pathway. That's why I like to use pathways, because then it gets away from this idea of gene set. Um, so our gene list is overlapped with the pathway. There's some co number of common things. And the pathway is overlapped with the whole genome, or the, the, the background. Um, and the output of the enrichment test is a p-value. So the p-value assesses the probability that the overlap is at least, at least as large as observed by random sampling the universe. So if I just take my gene list, which say it has 100 genes, and I randomly pick 100 genes from the genome thousands or millions of times, um, what's the, the p-value assesses, is supposed to assess um, the likelihood that I get the amount of overlap that I see by chance. And, um, and it's at least as large as observed. So you could have that amount of overlap or more overlap. So that's, does that make sense? the p-value means. Okay, so general recipe for gene list enrichment test is um, to define your gene list and your background list. Uh, often the background is like the whole genome, unless you're working with an experiment that doesn't, can't capture the whole genome. Uh, select your gene sets to test for enrichment. That's the pathways. So find, define some pathways. Previously I recommended gene ontology biological process. And then run the enrichment tests and correct for multiple testing if necessary. Usually it is necessary because we, we, uh, each of these tests just does one pathway at a time. So we do one pathway, say I'm looking at gene ontology, biological process, and there's a thousand biological process terms that I'm considering. I run this test once for each of those terms. And each time I run it, I get a p-value. So I get a thousand p-values. And then the significant p-values are the ones that are enriched, are the pathways that are enriched. Now, one of the problems with that is that because I've done a thousand tests, um, there's a chance that I could get some, you know, good overlap by chance because the more I do these tests, the more likely I could, I could get that. So you have to correct for that, as I mentioned, and I'll talk about it in more detail. Um, and then interpret your enrichments, which we'll talk about more this afternoon, and then publish. Yay. Um, okay, so um, the possible problems uh, that I mentioned with the gene list idea is that there's no natural value for the threshold. There could be a natural value, in which case you're welcome to use it, um, there, uh, which that could lead to different results at different threshold settings. And you could potentially lose statistical power due to thresholding because um, you might have weak effects that combine to make a strong effect. So maybe none of the genes in your pathway are really strongly differentially expressed but they're all differentially expressed a little bit and all in the same direction. And that is a signal that's statistically significant and would, it's unlikely that that would occur by chance. And so you'd, you'd miss that if you thresholded it. So one of the advantages of the rank, thing, the rank list idea is that it can go, it can take all the information that you have. And that's a good advantage. So it, it, it takes the weak signals as well as the strong signals. Um, okay, so the ranked, the ranked list idea. So again, we take this, uh, this experimental type. So we have multiple replicates in class A and class B, um, and we uh, we compute a differential expression, or different differential statistic to rank to get a rank list. So again, the, the things at the top of this list are genes. So each row here is a gene. Uh, genes at the top are upregulated in red, and genes at the bottom are upregulated in in blue. Say the blue class, um, and then we use one of these two statistical methods to compute the p-value. And you don't need to choose a threshold, so that's the idea of being hammering. Um, okay, so this recipe is for ranked list is slightly different. Step one is you rank your genes, and then after that it's the same. Select your pathways, run the enrichment test, correct for multiple testing, interpret your enrichments, and, and, and finish. Okay, so the theory component. So 
Hypertrometric test is used for calculating enrichment of p-values for gene lists. Um, GSEA and minimum hypergeometric test is for computing enrichment of p-values for ranked lists. The multiple testing corrections that we'll cover are Bonferroni and Benjamini Hochberg FDR. There are others, but these are the two that you frequently use. Okay, so the hypergeometric test, also known as the Fisher's exact test. Okay, so um, the null hypothesis from statistical terminology is a list, uh, the list this gene list is a random sample from the population. The alternative hypothesis that we're trying to test for is that there are more, uh, in this case, black genes than, than red genes um, expected. So let's say we have a bunch of genes and we're going to call them, um, you know, there's 500 black genes uh, in the genome and, and 4,500 4, red genes in the genome. And my list has one red gene and four black genes. Now is that you know, given this, is that statistically significant? So the hypergeometric test uh, models the expected um, uh, amount of basically seeing the probability of seeing, uh, you know, zero black uh, genes in the list, one black gene in the list, two black genes in the list, three, etc., five, up to five, right? So five, getting five, five out of five is uh, very unlikely. Getting zero is more likely because there are many more red genes than black genes. So if we just have mostly red genes in this bucket and we're just picking red genes, we're most likely to get red genes, right? And sometimes we'll get um, black genes according to this ratio. Okay, so, um, so the, the answer to this uh, statistic of how likely it is that we get four is the sum of the, of, of the probabilities of four and five. Remember I said um, it measures the overlap of like uh, of of how many um, black genes and black genes are like pathway uh, genes in a pathway like cell cycle. Um, so the um, so we got four out of five black genes here, and um, the probability that we get that is this basically the combination of seeing four or five, four out of five, or five out of five. Um, and so that's where the at least comes from. So this answer is the probability of seeing this is 4.6 times 10 to the negative 4. So this is basically looked up or computed automatically from this, this equation that is behind the Fisher's exact test. Um, and that's, that's the p-value. Um, this is the whole distribution here is the null distribution, and this is what's assumed by this, this test. Um, you can also think about it as the um, two by two contingency table. So you compute this by the two by two contingency table for the Fisher's exact test. Um, so you, again, you have these four numbers, um, genes that are in the gene set versus genes that are not in the gene set and genes that are, say, sorry, this should, let's just call this pathway. In the pathway, not in the pathway, in your list, not in your list. Um, and these numbers go into computing it. You can look up the formula online. It's not that complicated, but it's... Um, we're not presenting it here. Okay, so uh, just a few details. Um, the test for under enrichment of uh, is is the test for of of black is a test for over enrichment of red. So you can s switch those. Um, you need to choose your background population appropriately. I talked about that, and you need to again it's it's the the list of genes that you could possibly identify in your experiment. Um, and you need to consider when your experiment's very biased and you not include the genes that it can't see in the, in the background. Um, and, the, um, uh, and, and you can't, you can't uh, do all of your tests with all the pathways in one go. You have to, um, the test for enrichment of more than one independent type is different. You have to apply this Fisher's exact test separately from each, each type. Okay, so other um, enrichment tests uh, you could consider the binomial or the chi-squared, I briefly mentioned that, and then the ranked list is, um, you know, this, uh, what we're going to get into, and the Wilcoxon rank sum is mentioned there, so, and the Mann-Whitney U-test, Kalmogorov, Smirnov, etc. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so I covered gene lists, and we went over the Fisher's exact test and how it works. Now, ranked gene lists. Okay, so one test for a ranked gene list is the minimum hypergeometric test. This is very simple. Um, you, you take your ranked gene list and you set a threshold. I said don't set the threshold, but in this case you actually set a threshold. 
Um, and I'll tell you why in a sec. So then you compute the Fisher's exact test, and then you change the threshold to make it a little bit more permissive, and then you compute the Fisher's exact test, and you change it again, and actually go through all the thresholds. So um, in that case, you, um, you are actually trying all the thresholds, and you'll see if any of those thresholds gives a uh, enrichment. And at least one enrichment, you'll like say it's enriched. And you have to correct for multiple testing within that because you're doing lots of tests. So that that's um, sometimes used. So the G profiler tool that we cover in the class uses this idea uh, of the minimum hypergeometric test. The advantage of uh, I'll, I'll go through the advantages and disadvantages in a sec. Okay. The second idea is that there's this GSEA test, um, and the GSEA test uh, looks uses the uses um, uh, a, a particular type of statistics, which I'll explain. So remember, the rank-based statistics, like, like when, there, when there's a bunch of pathway genes at the top of the list, like all bunched up at the top, compared to randomly spread across the list. Okay, so the way that it computes this is it goes down the rank list one by one, and it says, is this gene, is the top gene in the list in the pathway, yes or no? If it's not in the pathway, it doesn't do anything. If it's in the pathway, a score goes up. So it just goes down and if, um, actually I guess the score goes down um, ideally if it's not in the pathway. Um, if it is in the pathway, that's what these red bars mean. So each, each vertical line here represents a gene. This whole long thing is a, gene a ranked gene list. They're ranked by differential expression. Uh, if it's red, then it means that the pathway, that the gene is part of a pathway. And, um, and we just go through one by one. Um, the score goes down basically if there's a uh, if the gene is not part of the pathway, and it goes up if the score if the gene is part of the pathway. So if everything's bunched up at the top, the score will go up quite a lot. If everything's spread out over the list, the score will kind of stay. It will go up and down, but it won't really. There won't be any peaks. So basically, what the score does is it takes this maximum peak here, and it says that's the enrichment score. Now you have to do some more statistics to get a p-value from it, um, because this is not. A, this doesn't define a p-value. It just says that um, it's just a way of scoring pathways that are bunched up at the top of the list. Okay, so going from an uh, enrichment score to a p-value, there's two ways that you can do this. Um, the main way that um, that uh, works for GSEA is that you have to compute what's called an empirical p-value. And an empirical p-value is a p-value that you don't compute with a simple statistical test. You have to compute by going back to basics of statistics and doing permutation. So you do random sampling, and, um, and then you, um, you, ask, you do enough random sampling that you can estimate like, how often you see. Like if I do 2,000 random samplings, how often do I see the, the, like, this enrichment score at this height by chance? Right? And if you never see it in 2,000 random samplings, it's very significant because one, every, you, you can't even see it if you do 2,000 or 5,000 random samplings. If you see it in half of the results, well, it's like not very significant because half the time you do random sampling, you see an enrichment score that high. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, okay, so um, you compute an empirical p-value uh, for each gene set overlap, and you generate a null hypothesis distribution from the randomized data. Um, and you can, you know, there's a few different ways that you can um, choose to do this. Um, so um, this is, um, and th this basically just says what I explained, that you look for your real enrichment score to see how often it appears in all these enrichment scores from random, random sampling. And I'll tell you how, how to do the random sampling in a sec. Okay, so... Um, you know, in this case, the real enrichment score was seen in four out of 2,000 random samplings. So the p-value is basically that. It's 0 0.002, so it's 4 divided by 2,000. Okay, that's it. That's how you compute an empirical p-value. Um, okay, so there's different ways you can do this, uh, which we'll talk about, but one of the things you can choose is the number of times you do your sampling. The more you do this, the longer it's going to take to compute. Um, that's the basic idea. So if you if you set that number really big, uh, if your computer's not that fast, you might be waiting like hours. Um, but you know, 
the bigger you set that, the more compute time it takes because it has to do this random samplings and it's doing the whole process 2,000 times in that case. Okay, um, so um, the you don't have to do this for this minimum hypergeometric uh, method because um, minimum hypergeometric method just can rely on a multiple test correction, um, which I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, sorry, one more thing that is not on these slides, but it's important to mention is that there's another way. Uh, so actually, just the way that GSEA. I don't know. Do you do you, Veronique, Do you cover this uh, permutation based thing in the lab? Um, just one slide. Okay. So just to briefly. Yeah. Gene, the, you cover gene set permutation. Okay. So the, there's two in GSEA. There's two ways of doing permutation. One is you can randomly select gene sets to so kind of randomly create pathways and you repeat with random generations of pathways. Another way is you, if you have cases and controls, um, you can randomly uh, split up the cases and controls, and so that mixes up your data so that the differential expression will be, um, will be um, uh, computed based on random assignments to the classes. Uh, we typically, well, in the lab, we'll typically use the gene set, the pathway uh, permutations, because um, usually... Um, I guess it's a bit complicated to, to explain this, but uh, originally GSEA was made for microarray data, and it had all statistics inside of it to do the com compute the differential expression, um, and so it could split up the class labels and recompute the differential expression, and then redo everything. For RNA seq, it doesn't actually have, and I don't know of a tool that makes available all the RNA seq statistics. So RNA seq statistics are typically handled in an R package like Edge R. Um, or you know one of the others, and then um, and then we load the ranked list into Gene Mania and into GSEA. So um, then it's hard. Then if you wanted to do the permutation based on class labels, you have to do that somehow outside of GSEA, and that requires coding in R, which if anyone's interested, we can cover, but we can talk about offline. Um, so we'll talk about that again. Don't worry about that too much. It will be mentioned again in the lab, and you'll get more into it in the lab. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so here's an example of the GSCA plots that what they look like. So this is a plot of a highly enriched gene set. So you, in GSCA, you can actually see these plots. And so you can see, oh, yes, it's like really enriched. Here's one that is not really enriched. It kind of goes up and down. And here's one that's depleted. So you can see how that corresponds, how these, these, uh, Col uh, red and blue colors correspond to these patterns here. Okay. Okay. Multiple testing correction. Um, that's the last uh, topic here. Um, okay. So I mentioned that um, you have to correct for multiple testing, and I kind of mentioned why. Uh, so this is the just an example of why. So how to win the p-value lottery, part one. So if, if I am looking for my set of, you know, my, that example that I had with four black balls and one red ball um, out of the set, um, if I keep on making random draws, like sometimes I get four reds, sometimes I get five reds, sometimes I get four reds, you know, like at, a, you know, 7,834 draws later, oops, I get one that's like exactly the, as enriched with, with uh, you know, has as few red balls as, as this. Um, and we can expect a random draw with an observed enrichment once every 1 divided by the p-value of draws. So if the p-value is 0.05, divide, 1 divided by 0.05. That's how many draws you expect to get a random draw that looks like what you have. So if you, um, you, know, if you have a really, 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 really good p-value, it's always going to be good because like, if it's 10 to the minus 100, you know, that's a really huge number of draws that you'll expect randomly before you get that pattern. But if it's 0.05, well, it's like 20 or something, right? So um, that's not that many. And if you're doing 5,000 pathways, then it, you expect to get pathways with p-value of 0 0.05 by chance quite a few times. So you have to correct for that. Um, so um, the, um, yeah, so this is just the example with actual pathways. So uh, in this case, we have, um, you know, you do the you do the draw. This is like testing for one pathway. This is testing for the next pathway. This is testing for the next pathway. That's what this slide is just explaining that 
it's not that you're doing the same test over and over again. You're doing one pathway and then the next pathway and then the next pathway. So it's not exactly the same as that a simple example that I mentioned because the pathways are different sizes. There's different numbers of red and black balls. Um, so it's not easy to sort of figure that out. Um, so uh, there are two major tests that, that people use. Uh, Bonferroni test. How many people have heard of the Bonferroni test or used it? Okay, and Benjamini FDR or FDR test? Okay, so less people with that. So Bonferroni is the kind of simplest test for multiple te uh, correction for multiple tests. Um, you basically uh, multiply the p-value by the number of tests. Very simple. That's why everybody, more people have heard of that. Um, the actual thing, what it means, uh, the actual definition of it, is that the corrected p-value is going to be greater than or equal to the probability that one or more of the observed enrichments could be due to random draws. So the jargon for this in statistics is that it controls for the family-wise error rate. So that actually ends up very stringent. It, it's, it's very stringent because it says that um, we expect out of all of our tests, none of them should be like present due to random draws. But in practice, um, it's very stringent, and so it can get rid of real enrichments. Um, and often one is willing to accept a less stringent condition, like I'm okay with 5% false positives. I'll deal with it at the, at the, uh, benefit of, with the benefit of being able to get more signal out of my data. Um, okay, and then, so this FDR is a gentler way of doing it. So the FDR is the expected proportion, so the false discovery rate is the expected proportion of the observed enrichments due to random chance. So again, this is like the percentage of false positives that I expect to see. Um, and compare this to Bonferroni, which means that like none of the enrichments or, you know, the probability that any of the enrichments is due to random chance. Um, okay, so Benjamini Hochberg is the, the names of the people who developed this FDR test, uh, this, this correction method. Um, and the result of this correction method is also often called the Q value, which you might see in various tools. So they convert the P value to a Q value. Q value is the multiple tested correction, multiple, multiple test corrected version of the P value. Um, okay, so here's an example of how it actually works. Um, so you sort the p-values of all the tests in increasing order, so the best p-values are at the top, and then you, um, uh, you basically do this uh, test where you multiply the p-value by the number of tests divided by the rank of the p-value. So 53 divided by 1, 1 is, that means that this p-value is like number 1 in a list. 2 means number 2 in the list. 3 means number 3 in the list. So over, like, so the top p-values, um, uh, so basically um, you get like a gentler correction as you go down, the, go down the list. So in the end, this gets just multiplied by 1. Um, so that's Benjamin and Hochberg created this, this idea, and the, st the theoretical statistics behind it are what I mentioned. Um, how, how it actually works is seem, seemingly fairly simple how it's actually computed, I mean. Okay, so um, the Q value, or the FDR, corresponds to the P value, or nominal P value, sometimes called. Um, that's the smallest adjusted P value assigned to uh, P values with the same or larger ranks. So um, uh, I guess that, you know, I've never found this definition to be as useful as just thinking about this in terms of the expected false positive rate. Um, and but here's an, here's an example. So um, so this p-value 0.0031 has a, um, a uh, it's a p-value th uh, it meets the p-value threshold of FDR of less than 0.05. So um, it's the highest ranking p-value for which the Q value is be below the desired significance threshold. So if I say I want um, if yeah so this is I guess explaining how to use the the Q value. So you compute your Q values and you choose a threshold, like I'm okay with 5% false positives or I'm okay with 10% false positives, and you cut this, um, this Q value at that point, and then the corresponding P value is the P value that is the highest, the, the um, worst P value for which you expect to have that many false positives. So after that, the p-values are going to be in false positive territory according to your, your threshold. Okay, so 
Um, the stringency of multiple testing depends on the number of tests that you do. So uh, the more tests that you do, the more sensitive the test has to be, or the more strong the signal in your data. Um, and so one way of, of making this less stringent is by reducing the number of tests. So this is one of the reasons um, why I recommend starting a pathway enrichment analysis with just pathways instead of incorporating everything in gene ontology and everything that you could incorporate because the more things you incorporate the worse your multiple testing correction is going to be so you're going to have to multiply your p-values by bigger numbers in general um, and uh, so it's just imp an important thing to be aware of um, oops um, okay so uh, to summarize this um, let's see if this Okay, PowerPoint issue. Um, to summarize, uh, the um, ranked list, um, and we'll go over in the lab like tools that use this. So just to give you a preview, G Profiler, which is a freely all of, basically everything we talk about in this class is freely available. Um, G Profiler is um, uh, uses this minimum hypergeometric test where you you compute the normal hypergeometric at different thresholds. Um, GSEA uses uh, this enrichment score followed by empirical p-values and then multiple testing correction um, is, is applied to that. Um, Bonferroni is a very stringent test of uh, multiple testing, sorry, it's a very stringent multiple test correction. And FDR is a more forgiving one that controls the proportion of false positives. Um, one thing to, so this is the end of this, this lecture. One thing to mention is uh, that's important to know in pathway enrichment analysis is that pathways are not independent. There are pathways, they're not necessarily independent. So you could have two pathways that are related to each other, right? They have a lot of genes in common. Like I could say, um, uh, you know, I don't know, looking for an example, like, um, I don't know, a bunch of pathways are related to control of chromatin state. They're likely going to affect, include the same genes in some way, or they're going to have overlaps, especially in gene ontology where we have these uh, terms that you can go all the way up the hierarchy and assign them all to a gene, and all of those terms are by definition overlapping with each other. Um, and so the basis of this multiple testing correction is that the tests are independent. But when we test for enrichment of a pathway, and then we have a very similar pathway and we test for enrichment of that and then another similar pathway and we test for enrichment of that, the tests are not completely independent. They're partially independent because it's not like we're running the exact same test over and over again with the same pathway. It's different pathways, there's different numbers of different genes, but they're overlapping. In general, none of the standard pathway enrichment analysis methods model that, um, that uh, that issue, that overlap between the gene sets. There are some that have been published that try to do it, but they're not widely used um, because they have, uh, there might be other issues with using them. Um, like, in general, the problem is, is that that problem is not fully solved statistically of how to do, how to correct for multiple testing across automatically um, uh, using that type of, in that type of scenario where you have Gene, -less gene sets that are, you know, pathways that, that are similar. Um, and, um, and so as a result, the multiple tested correction values that come out of pathway enrichment analysis are not exactly correct statistically because it's not, it's not meeting the assumptions of the correction test. Um, so uh, what we do, what we'll talk about later is um, kind of a, a way, there's no, because there's no perfect solution right now, uh, we use a reasonable solution or an approximate solution, which is visualizing and exploring the results and grouping uh, pathways that are similar. So you can identify major themes, and then you can study the p-values associated with those themes to see if, um, like, what the distribution of p-values is across all the similar pathways. Uh, that'll become clear later when Veronique talks about the when we talk about the enrichment map um, this afternoon. Mm -hmm.